I'm Frances, and I'm a doctoral student at Michigan State in the Math Ed program. I some students here. So I'm hoping a few more people will trickle in after the autograph signing that's happening over there. But we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so when starting to think about using math to explore social justice issues, a lot of times the first question that comes up is, why this attempt to make math political? And one thing to think about is that math is around us all the time in terms of already being the political way that we view the world. Great right? numbers that come up in the media, making sense of math, and kind of the power that those numbers have. Right? So being able to learn to use math to explore social justice issues actually gives you more power to make sense of those numbers when they're presented to you. Um, the other thing that kind of comes up is a lot of times the mathematics that we see as being neutral right, does tell a story. It's just the story that we're so used to hearing that we don't see kind of the political story going on behind that particular mathematics. So these are two typical problems that you might see um, in school mathematics. I'm going to give you a couple minutes just read through those and maybe talk with the person next to you about what kind of story you think those problems are telling beyond the mathematics. Well, I guess looking at it in like a political way, um, the first one, just because 25 are boys doesn't mean that the rest are girls. So that there might be others in there, so you can't really answer that question. Great. So I heard Lynette talking about that too, this idea that there are only two genders that we need to account for. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take into consideration that there are actually multiple ways that people identify. Anything else? Thought of with the first. There's no right answer. It's, like, it's not like a typical math class, maybe. <laughs> um, another thing that I, people have raised when I've shown this problem before is that um, the emphasis is on the boys, and in a math classroom, that can kind of very subtly right, reinforce that math is for boys uh, if this is a problem in a math textbook. What about the second one? just because there's the three ages that it's three individuals and that's a lot of candy bars for three people mm -hmm. and that can pose health issues so the health issues another thing that sometimes comes up in this problem is consumerism right? so a lot of our story problems in textbooks are around purchasing things right? which kind of goes along with 
um, the American culture of consuming, right? And when people in other countries see that, oftentimes they're a little taken aback because it's not as ingrained in the culture there. So it just kind of reinforces that message. So this was just to kind of get you started thinking a little bit about how the problem we might be looking at may seem very political, right? And so when you make a choice to kind of use math to look at these political things, just keeping in mind that you could argue that all the math that we do has this sort of political nature, not even when it's in a story problem, but just in kind of where the math came from, right, and who determines what math knowledge is valid. So the problem that we're going to look at specifically today uh, is we're going to use mathematics to try to understand a little bit more about the distribution of wealth in the world. So this is a task it's appropriate for around like, middle school age students that works a lot with proportional reasoning and percentages. So the mathematics itself might be pretty simple. I just wanted to kind of use this as an example of how you can start to take kind of data that's available and use that in sort of a simple way to kind of break down the mathematics and really understand what's going on. So we give each of you a map. that off and label it on your map. We're also identifying Africa as a continent, Asia as a continent. And then we're going to call the general area around Australia, New Zealand, Oceania. And then we're going to do something maybe a little unconventional with North and South America. So because Mexico has such a different kind of wealth than say the United States and Canada, we're actually going to identify the United States and Canada as one region, and we're going to put Mexico with Central and South America as Latin America. So you can label those regions on your map. live in the world. Right? So if we're going to talk about wealth, we need to talk about how it's kind of distributed to all the people that live in these regions. So on the back of your map, there's a place for you to write your guess. And then I'm going to ask some of you to share that number. So let's see if you've got a number yet. Seven billion. Seven billion. Do we have a different number? Eight billion. Eight billion. Six point seven. Twenty-seven. So again, when you do this with middle school students, you usually get quite a range of guesses. <laughs> so you're all very close. Uh, this is one of the recent figures that I found. 
So we're actually going to express the number of people in terms of millions rather than billions. So in this box here, you can write, how would you write this number as millions of people? And I will go ahead and give that to you. Okay. So we're going to say that there are 6,910 million people in the world. And if we weren't in a workshop setting, right, I would ask you to do some of this research for yourself, too, so that you get some experience with that. The same with the world wealth. So we're going to talk about world wealth in terms of gross, na gross, gross national product, right, which is um, measured for each region and then added together for the world wealth. So this is all of the wealth in the world. We want to write that number in terms of billions of dollars. Do you want us to do this table? Yep, so once you've figured it out, let's just check in and make sure we're all on the same page. So how many people are, are represented by one dot? If we have 16 dots. 131. And how many people, how many are, how much wealth is represented by one dollar sign? We have 16. Did anyone get a different value for that? Okay. So once you have that, then I want you to fill in this table here. So how many people do you think would be represented by dots in Africa, and how many 
how much wealth do you think would be represented by dollar signs in Africa? So you're going to do that for the six global regions. You're also welcome to draw those dots and dollar signs on your map if you'd like. <laughs> and then I'd like you to work with your partner to figure out what percentage of the total population and what percentage of the total world wealth is represented by your guests. So we only use whole dots? Only whole dots.
Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
you get to stay in Europe. <laughs> you get to go to Latin America. And you get to go to the US and Canada. So if you can move to the proper region, take your pencil with you. Think about how these numbers compare to what your estimated percentage 
percentages of distribution were that we did on the other worksheet. And then I want you to choose one person in your group to be a traveling negotiator. Right? So you're going to take a couple of minutes here to decide who that negotiator is going to be. And then you can go to a different country and try to negotiate some sort of trade. Right? Don't take the trade yet, but we'll have an open trading session once you all sit back down. So decide who is going to travel. If you're happy with your distribution of wealth, you don't have to travel. Would you trade like this, like one servers for two servers, like that, or whatever? Whatever, whatever negotiation you come up with. Right. Okay. So you can trade, or you can ask for a donation. So these are essentially the ground rules. Right. So only the traveling negotiators can move to different global regions, and when those negotiators arrive, they'll sit down with your region and discuss the distribution of wealth and what should be done about it. Okay, so I'm going to give you two minutes for that. Ideally not enough time, but <laughs> probably a bit of a short schedule. So negotiators, whenever you're ready. <laughs>
pretty close to the percentages that you calculated before? We were pretty close. You're pretty close. But for the people, okay. that's pretty close. We swung and missed on the Asia GNP. Okay. And I have lots of wealth, so I'm not sure <laughs> you guys are welcome to take charters. The US has a nap. Is this how it works? <laughs> so is there anyone who was who was really surprised by if you don't want them you can leave them. Is there anyone who was really surprised by anything else in terms of how they compared to your guests? There was a lot less people in Europe than I expected. There is. Just kind of good to know. Are there any other questions that I didn't bring up that came up for people? The GMP in India and China has gone up a lot, so but they still um, uh, China has such a tremendous population that and India has such a tremendous mm -hmm. population that you know they're growing economically, so that's probably what we gotta be. Yeah. Two extra ones there. Yeah. yeah. It, it makes me unusual too about like what's the, the wealth distribution within the regions, right? Yeah. yeah. Because even Good though point. their GMP is going up, it's very much in the hands of like. Yeah. So this is actually the, the this is actually the follow up activity to this activity. It's called Ten Tiers of Inequality, and on the bottom of the sheet, there's a link to a PDF that explains this. Um, but this talks about wealth distribution within the United States specifically, right? And so if I brought 10 of you up and put 10 of you in a chair each, right, that would equal, like, equal distribution of wealth in people. And then I would move you around to show the actual distribution within the country, right? And so we, you can talk about kind of how, yes, this is like a nice global snapshot, but what's going on in Asia, right? Like, you have wealthier countries in Asia and then countries that aren't wealthy at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then kind of what's going on with even within the United States or even within our state, right, or our local communities. Um, so you can kind of scale down, but this is kind of a nice entry point. And then kind of as you get to more and more local scales, the students can actually, or you can feel kind of more empowered to do things in your local community. But even at a larger scale, there are things that you can do. Um, you have a link to the Borgen project as well. And they have, you can enter your zip code here, and you can actually call um, your congressperson like three times a week and say that you want them to kind of a lot more money for poverty reduction. And those calls do make a difference. Okay, so they kind of keep track of what their constituents are calling and asking for. And then this is another um, website, which is the fareconomy.org link that has some ideas for kind of how you can take action. And again, this is on kind of a larger country or global scale, but as you get kind of into the local community, there's sort of even more that you can do with that. So these are some resources more specific to teaching math for social justice in schools for any of you, for any of those who might be teachers. And that's kind of what my research interests focus on. And if you think you might be interested in that, then you're welcome to put your name and email on here, and I will put you on my mailing list and keep you up to date with kind of local workshops or kind of resources that you might find useful. You know, so, the thing about some of the spread of wealth there, um, you still have the higher-handed Chinese government as far as even though China's getting more well. In India, you still have a caste system, where yeah. probably our system is probably the best system, is the best system in the world, because you can be any ethnic or any country or any, anybody that comes here and make, if you have a good idea, you can you can uh, improve your lot in life here, so. And that's one idea, right, that could be kind of explored further in looking at wealth distribution in the U.S. and how it plays out by race is also kind of interesting. Any questions?
some thoughts and I'd like to share. So hopefully this is not too radical of an idea, okay? but it's more about kind of raising awareness um, and getting kids to think more proactively right, about their world and the world that they live in and how they can use numbers to make sense of that world so that they don't feel powerless when they see all these numbers being thrown around in the news right, and not really having kind of the knowledge that they need to make sense of that. Right, but being able to kind of go to the raw data and process that in some way. So. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.